And welcome to a very special episode of Funny Talk with Mangeli and Max. We have a great, uh, ho- or, uh, great guest for you tonight. He's a comic. He's a musician. He's a he's a philosopher. The the one, the only, uh, Dennis Blair. Hi, Dennis. How you doing? Uh, you know, I didn't know I was a philosopher, but uh, I guess I'm still okay. Thanks. <laughs> and uh, of course, I'm Tom Mangeli, and my co-host Doug Max. Say hi, Doug. Hi, Doug, and and our tri host tonight, the, the our wonderful friend, comedy aficionado, person who knows everyone, literally everyone, Jack Hoffman. Hi, Jack. Hey, how's everybody doing? It's hey, Jack. Good to, it's been a while. It's good to be back on the show. Good to have you. It's good to see you again, Jack. It's great. and Jack Jack Hoffman, of course, is our uh, our sponsor for the show. Uh, with his company, J. Irwin Productions. And uh, if you need to get a uh, comedy show together for a private affair, a fundraiser, um, a showcase at a restaurant, uh, anything like that, you contact Jack at jirwinproductions.com. He's the guy to call. He's the guy to know. And just, just don't tell my wife I, I do affairs, though, okay? She, she, <laughs> she'll get pissed. And listen. You're, if you're in the New York, New Jersey area and you need something else, you need a special request, things maybe you don't want to talk about publicly, write to Jack at jirwinproductions.com. He knows every comic. Believe me, we can find a comic that, that needs the money. They'll do, they'll do almost anything you want. <laughs> I work with over 250 different comics. Wow. And a few the same. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we've got a special guest, Dennis Blair. Dennis, I've never met you, so I'm going to begin. I'm going to begin with with the question, Dennis Blair. Is that a question? Yes, I I (laughs) asked that with a question mark. That's the the universal, who are you, what are you, why are you here, where are you going, what's up? Well, first I want to ask Jack, how how is Linda McConaughey doing? Linda McConaughey? I don't yeah. know who Linda Well, McConaughey. they said you know everybody. Oh. So, you know, um, Is she in high school with you or something? I, I'm not telling you. You know everybody. I'm, <laughs> apparently, you've just been busted. So That's there. It. Be very careful when you say he knows everybody, because he, I will he, hear that, and I will okay. use that against the perpetrator. Okay. Anyway. Well, listen, Linda is fine, and thank God the gluten-free <laughs> diet has yeah. turned her life around. Hold Linda, on, it's Linda. We love Cole. you. Hold on, Linda. Uh, Dennis did ask for you. Hold on. Good save. Good save. Very good save. Very proud of you. Dennis, you wrote a book recently. We've got to ask you. Tell us about your book. I wrote a book recently. I don't know if you knew that. Um, I, you wrote a book. I yes. Know, I heard Isn't that weird? Somewhere. Strange that you'd have me on on that day. Um, yes. The name of the book is Touring with Legends, and the reason that it's titled that is because I spent a goodly part of my career as a comic uh, touring with legends, hence the name. Rodney Dangerfield, Joan Rivers, George Carlin, Tom Jones, uh, the Beach Boys, you name it. You name Linda McConaughey, you name it. I toured (laughs) with all of these people. Wow. And it's about my adventures with them. It's about backstage stories and how it was hanging out with them and how some of them became uh, pretty close friends of mine and uh, traveling on the road with uh, these big, big famous people. And uh, it's a cool uh, thing, I think. It, wow. It's very cool. So what sort of things can you actually tell us about? There's absolutely nothing I can say on the air. Sorry. And this has been Dennis Blair on <laughs> Funny Talk with Mongeli and Max. Tune in next week. How many years did you go on the road with George? With, Carl. With, George, with George, it was 18 years I was on the road with him. It started as wow. three months. It started out as three months. Uh, it was just a trial run for three months. My agent called me out of the blue uh, and said, hey, would you like to uh, open for George Carlin for three months? And I said, let me get back to you. Yes, 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 <laughs> definitely. And uh, I took him up on that offer and uh, three months uh, t- went well. And uh, we got along really great. So three months became uh, 18 years when George turned to me and said, hey, you just want to stay? And I said, I got nothing else to do. So (laughs) I stayed for 18 years. 
Wow. Now, how old were you when you started with them? Four. How old was I when I started? That's, a, that's an excellent question. I believe, uh, let's see, 1988 is when I started. So was it 43 or something like that? 42, something like that? Okay. Yeah. And, and when, did you, when did you start with the comedy? Uh, I started in 1979. Here's what happened. I'll give you the brief story because we don't yeah. want to uh, bore your viewers. They want to get to Linda McConaughey. No, they, they <laughs> actually, this is, this is why they come to us. Ah, we are, we are the sleeping aid of comedy shows. I <laughs> see. Well, then, then put me right in. Um, <laughs> so 1979, I was still a struggling musician slash songwriter. I wanted to be really famous like James Taylor, except without the heroin addiction. <laughs> and I was out there, you know, playing my wares and being in bands, you know, all music all the time. I was a kind of funny guy, you know, but uh, wasn't doing it professionally. And I would play these bars and, you know, you play these bars. And uh, if you ever been to one of these things, the, the poor singers, guitar players up there and no one's listening at all. And yeah. I got indignant. They weren't listening to me, these people. I was pouring my heart out by doing cover songs of James Taylor and Paul Simon and Bob Dylan. And they weren't listening to their screw ups. Yes, I know. So I went up and I very angry. I wrote a parody to uh, a BG song that was popular at the time, a little sling thing called uh, Staying Alive. And my parody was Singing Too High. And uh, I came back after my break. I came back after my break and I sang a couple of the cover songs. And then I launched into Singing Too High. And people went, hey, those, wait, that's not the words. He's screwing him up and they went oh it's, it's a joke i get it and they started laughing and i'm going oh the people are laughing so i did more of those i did like a bob dylan parody and a, a beatles parody and then i started putting in some comedy uh in between and so from like just be fooling around on a stage in a bar in long island in 1979 i started uh, developing this comedy act That's and then i took that little act of danger fields and it went on from there i have to tell you i, you I really island? get it I, What's I've been. Oh, who's talking? Jack just asked me something. If he grew up on Long Island, is that yes? Uh, Whitestone, born, born in the Bronx, uh, lived in Whitestone uh, for most of my life till I moved out to New York City. Manhattan. You could tell he's from Whitestone because they say they're Long Island, but they're really Queens. I know, I know. Well, you know, I, I'm trying. Long Island. <laughs> I'm I'm reaching for the big time. What can I tell you? <laughs> I want to say I'm so je jealous of your musical talent. I wish. I, I can't tell you how many times I've been in shows where, you know, I felt like, like I was funnier, but the audience loves the cute girl singing with the ukulele, you know, or something like that. I know. And I, I know. tried, I tried doing an entire stand up act with my saxophone, but when you're <laughs> playing the sax and delivering comedy, people, you know, it mixes the sound and the words. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it comes out distorted, you know. I mean, uh -huh. two, two Jews uh -huh. walk into a bar. You saw me do that, Tom. Yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. Two Jews walked into a bar. Sounds like this. <laughs> it's not as funny. <laughs> it's like the teacher on the Peanuts cartoon. Yeah, yeah. Wah, 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 wah. Okay, so back back to you and your legends. <clears throat> well, wait a minute. First, screw the legends. We don't we don't care about them. We we care about you, Dennis. Oh, what are your favorite foods? <laughs> I love them. Uh, I love them White Castle hamburgers. You like them? Oh my God! No pickle, like extra onion. That's no, me. no, no. Pickle, pickle, okay, but no ketchup for me. No ketchup. Really? For me. Yeah, I don't like them with the ketchup. I like them plain with the pickle, but no ketchup. Favorite food there. They are. That's, that's the one that immediately popped into my mind. My father that remembers when they were twenty for a dollar. Yeah, but and they back came then. They, came they only the had three. They only had three flavor holes back in the forties. <laughs> so now we're up to five flavor holes. I'm sure you know. Yes. And I believe my my grandchildren will be experiencing White Castles that are nothing but flavor hole. And I can't imagine how delicious. You know, I called a guy a flavor hole once, and it didn't work out well for me. Wait, that was you? That was sorry. <laughs> I think you were wearing a ski mask at the time. So. <laughs> Flavor holes, yeah, that's that's a that's a good thing to call them. What's with the holes with the hamburger? Oh, that's for the flavor. Oh yeah, that's that's a good one. So yeah, that's my I gotta say that's my all time favorite. And you can tell immediately already what incredible uh, tastes I have in in, in culinary. Uh, yes, I see things. that. Now it yeah. used to be I could only eat a White Castles when I was drunk late at night, like two in the morning. 
Yeah. Now I don't, I don't drink anymore, but I still can't eat them in the daytime. I don't know what it is. It's got to yeah. be dark out. It's like a vampire meal or something. Because you I don't want to spend time... the rest of the day. In, in... Yeah. Last time I had them was there's a there's a White Castle next door to uh, uh, what's the name of the hotel, the Imperial Palace in Vegas here, and um, and I uh, and I, I last time I ate my, my 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 son and daughter came to Vegas for my birthday a couple of years ago. And they uh, said they had a surprise for me and they made me dress up and they put me in the car. And I said, where are we going? No, we're not telling you that. I'm like in a suit jacket. And I'm going, oh, this must be, they must be taking me to a show or it's something. It's a funeral. <laughs> it's a funeral. Someone died that I hate. It's going to be a great day. <laughs> and uh, and we get out and they bring me into White Castle uh, next to That's the Imperial great. Palace. And it was, I loved it, you know, even, even in my suit jacket. So, I've got a story first... about that in my in my routine. I do a joke about uh, you know I'm pretty serious, so I say something like you know my, I get date with this woman online, so I take her to a really you know I'm pretty classy. I take her to a nice place and order for her like a gentleman. <laughs> the lady will have three White Castle, no pickle. <laughs> that get, that gets as big a laugh as the the one line I get from my friend Tom. Oh, stop with that line. It, Tom, it's not even a line. It's a it's a it's an item. It's a reference. It's item. A reference. I, I tried I tried to help Doug out with his with yeah. his, uh... this is this is the kind of this is how desperate my how low my comedy is. That you he know was what sitting helps on a comedy? towel. I said instead of sitting on a towel, say she's sitting on a sham wow. Mm. Got a huge okay. laugh. I don't know why. Yeah, but, and yeah. when I do that joke, the audience doesn't stop laughing. I have to end my act right there. I know there's no point in me going on. Well, you know what you can do? There's this thing called a closer, and uh, you, you could move that bit since you can't follow it. You can move that to the end of the show, and that would solve all of your problems, unless your desire and your purpose is to is to get off earlier than you're supposed to be. But usually, oh no, I, I'm very comfortable. I've been a corporate trainer, so I, okay. I for 30 years, I'm very comfortable with silence and awkwardness. So, all, you know, if I time it wrong, I'm not going to admit that. I'm just going to. I'm going to stand up there boldly and, you know, look awkward. Good for, you. Good for you. Looking awkward is what we all do for a living, I think. Hey, I think yeah. so. Hey. So Tom. I want to ask, I want to go back to the legends before you get off on, make this a White Castle show. Um, <laughs> so I don't Damn. know how to ask this question, Dennis. You can, you can answer any question you want. We'll just call, consider this a universal. Uh, uh, how, how, one, one question is, um, I had the privilege of performing on the same stage as Gilbert Gottfried. And after the show, and I did great, but after the show, it was like, I didn't exist. So one, did, did that happen to you? Did it continually? Did you, you know, whatever, because you're next to George Carlin. That's mm -hmm. number one. And the other is of the legends, did you notice how they, how they managed or dealt with their legendary status differently or health? psychologically health healthily that's not a word i could discuss either of those questions for years but we okay. only have an hour right good we oh, got yeah. we got the time okay well let's go let's go to your first one uh, the disappearing the disappearing yeah. yes uh very familiar with that uh it didn't happen as much with carlin because carlin was more of a hermit i mean he didn't really he wasn't into hanging out you know and greeting people so, you know, I didn't have that experience with him that much because he'd get off the stage oh, and, and he'd want to go back to his hotel and work on his next, uh, his, his 37th HBO special. So, uh, <laughs> you know, and also with George, um, I, I got more of the, hey, who is that first guy? You know, because I get, it, it, usually the shows went well and they would go, who's that first guy? So some guy made a hat for me that said that first guy. <laughs> so, yeah, that was fun. So people would always know. Uh, with Rodney, it was that it was like that because Rodney was a hanger outer kind of guy. Hey, let's go, let's go, let's go to a restaurant, let's go eat somewhere. You know, what do you want to go? Let's go over here, let's go over there. Hey, what's that, people? Let's say hi to them, you know, that kind of deal. So, you know, and of course, if I'm with him, they don't even look at me, you know. Uh, it's like, I, yeah, it's like you don't even exist because it's the star, it's the guy they came yeah. to see. Yeah, and but, he, yeah. hey, what do you think of Dennis's show? Yeah, yeah, it was pretty good. Anyway, Rodney, when's your next movie? You know, it was that kind of stuff. <laughs> so that was really, that was really heartening and, and humiliating at the same time and really makes you, really builds up your confidence. Did you ever, did you ever work out, you know, like a bomb line to recover? Did you ever work out a, like a strategy like you'd, 
you'd throw up at the table and get noticed? No, that, nah, that example. No, nah, I just threw up at the table because I was eating White Castle. Callback. <laughs> call back. That was a callback. You see what I did? I think the you did. Uh, yeah. Now, what was the sec the second question? Was, oh, how do they treat their legendary uh, yeah. status? Uh, here's how Rodney treated it. Okay. Uh, Rodney kept saying uh, he, he was the most, I don't know if you ever met Rodney, but he was an extremely happy person. I mean, unhappy person, <laughs> unhappy person. And basically his whole attitude was, hey, Rodney, you're famous. Well, you can't be Shaq, you're a huge. He goes, yeah, what's it all mean, man? It's all bullshit, okay? Doesn't mean nothing. I know lots of stars. I met Bill Murray. I know Chevy Chase. I know Belushi. I know all these people. Don't mean nothing, all right? It's all bullshit. You're all gonna die anyway. So that's how my day would usually start with Rodney, where I <laughs> want to throw myself off of a bridge before the day was over. <laughs> with Carlin, with Carlin, he was uh, he just loved doing it. He loved writing. He loved performing. He just he was just thrilled to be out there and getting his his act out there. So it was a night like night and day. Uh, he was happy and uh, he, he I, I think he enjoyed his success uh, completely. So you had two diametrically opposed entities there in in one little package. Now was Carlin as brilliant as I as I uh, perceive him to have been? I think so. Uh, yeah, I mean, because the first night I opened for him and I hadn't met him before, uh, yeah. I was just the agent sent me there. And I'm, I'm like nervous as hell. And he comes down to my dressing room, never met him before. He goes, hey, Dennis, how the fuck are you? I'm George. And I go, I know. And he goes, yeah, what are those carrots? I had a deli tray. What are those carrots? I'm taking all of them. Fuck you. He takes all the air. It's okay. So I mean, there's like three minutes of that before we, I, I even perform. And I'm going, oh, this could be fun. Then I do my show. It goes well. I'm feeling pretty darn good about myself. George says, oh, this is great. Thanks for doing it. This is going to work out. I go up feeling good about myself to the balcony. And he does... Uh, his show, which is an hour and a half of stuff I have never heard before, and I immediately become depressed about my life and my abilities. <laughs> and everything is hilarious. I mean, it's crazy. <clears throat> and off stage, he would like, you know, he like one he'd just come up with stuff like off the top of his head. Like I was in the car waiting for him to go to a show, and he comes in the car. This is early in the morning, and the first thing he says is not hello. He goes, "Hey, Dennis, I was thinking." They got footage, they got yardage. How come they don't have inchage? And I'm going, I hate you. I hate you. You came up with that at nine in the morning. So yes, <laughs> just always thinking that the wheel's always turning. Can you imagine what he would be saying about no. the era we just went through? And I'm not getting yeah. into politics, but right. just think what it would be like to have him around now. Yes, really? people, people always ask me, what would George be saying? And I'm going, oh, well, you know, I mean, I have, I have my, I have my uh, opinions. What I th He'd think be using his seven words. Yes, he, oh, <laughs> yeah, that would, that would go. I mean, but I think his overriding thing was he was so, he had bailed on the whole human race a long time ago. So he would almost go, yeah, good, you deserve it, you stupid assholes. You know? <laughs> Just, you know. But you know something, he, he was one, you, you know, the great ones, in my opinion. Um, and we have some great ones now are are the fools in our society i mm -hmm. i not not to bring up the show but i studied shakespeare and i know that king lear's fool was one of the, the the only ones that could the only one that could speak truth to power and he masked it in whatever uh yeah yeah exactly cardonism i don't know what the word is sarcasm or whatever satire and uh you know john stewart and um um, John Oliver and mm -hmm. Colbert and right. you know the the big names the the people that will speak truth to the entire country about what's going on and they have a pulpit for that you know right. Right. I tried my first show at Gotham I tried dealing with with the Immaculate Conception and God it, it I was I didn't have the status to do that I <laughs> mm -hmm. but, yeah it's weird if, if you have, yeah if you have that uh, cachet behind you already it gets a lot easier but if you're you know, if you're just a guy at a comedy club and people are there to see comedy and they don't want, they want to have a good time and they don't want to have to talk, talk about controversial things, it's tough to, you got to find that angle where you can get both sides to laugh. It's and no, fuck no. these people. I brought, I brought the cachet. I had made it myself with the, the herbs from the year before. I had it in a beautiful little vase right behind me. It you know, I think enough. if you would, I think if you would place the cachet on the sham wow, you would have been better. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, again, that's just my opinion and my take. Don't go by me. I eat White Castle. Yes, I know. We, we, we needed the White Castle was, reference. Okay, we're up to three callbacks. So at some point, in the, we're going to see, we're going to try for uh, the, uh, what's the world record? The uh, Who does the world record? 
Guinness. Oh, a callback? Guinness. Guinness book. Guinness. Guinness. The Guinness Book oh, Guinness, of World yes. Record for callbacks. Yeah, let's do it. Is there a scorekeeper? Is there a tally board somewhere that I don't see? <laughs> well, I'm having bourbon, so we're up to seven. I'm just going to say seven. Well, Excellent. well, and I'm going to do it in Roman numerals. So it, so if they ask for documentation, it's like a Super Bowl. Wow. Yeah, it really is. It really you is. Know, I got. Yes. I'm sorry. I I don't mean to derail the train, but I have a stupid question. Growing up, I loved the Beach Boys. They were my. Mm -hmm. I saw them in concert um, fifteen times so wow. far. Mm -hmm. I hear they're going out on another tour. But yeah, anyway, they have, they, have, they have 13 I, different traveling Beach Boys now. Anyway, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Uh, now, you opened for the Beach Boys. Another comic that I, I knew and worked with, um, Dennis Ross. I don't know if you knew him from Jersey. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, he opened for the Beach Boys for a while also. In the 15 concerts I saw of the Beach Boys, they never had an opening act of a comic. Mm, really? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, wow. So, well, uh, I don't know why that is. I mean, I, I, I think I opened for them... Like, like three different three different times once was like a week-long thing in lake tahoe that was like 1980 okay and, uh, and then the next time was in atlantic city maybe a year after that for a weekend and then maybe just a one-off like a one-nighter kind of deal but the, yeah i mean i didn't i didn't work with them a lot but but you know enough yeah. enough that i got i mean i knew the i knew them when dennis was the drummer uh, dennis oh, wow. was the drummer, and brian was kind of playing keyboards but he kind of missed <laughs> He was he was having some problems and yeah, um, just a few. A yeah few. and he kind of he was he was he was at the piano but he wasn't playing the keys he was playing the top of the piano which <laughs> which didn't which wasn't miked so I don't know what the story was there I don't but know he if thought he, could, he was you know, playing the piano he thought he was playing the piano I don't yeah. know if it was a vision thing or you know no it's his, it's his it's strength a, that's you know you at a certain point people get so creative you can't even understand. No, that's, that's true. His, it's his that's eye true. hand coordination issues, I think. That's maybe, maybe. He was probably he's so, playing air piano. Tom, so given given Tom, that oblique kind of reference, I wanna I wanna circle back. You you said I didn't know this. James Taylor was a heroin addict? Or? Yes, he had a problem with heroin. I think that's that's common now. Yeah, he he, he I, talks I about not. it. Yeah, it's, I it's, think he wrote about I, it sure in his book. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Tom yeah, yeah. I, I I just want to say. What we have here with Dennis is a re really a Renaissance man. Oh, um, yeah. This guy, <laughs> you. Oh. And not only does he do comedy and some music, but he does music. We all remember Rappin' Rodney with mm. Robert Dangerfield. Guess who wrote that song? Get the hell out. Dennis. I don't like to brag. I don't like to brag. I like brag, you know. So you know. I, I wanted to ask you, you had mentioned other parody songs so what are some of the names of the parody songs from the Beatles, you said? And... Uh, the Beatles, uh, I did yesterday when Paul McCartney was busted in Japan. Uh, it, I, I didn't change the name. You know, I usually didn't name, I didn't usually, I, the, only, the ones that have the names are the, when, when the chorus has that phrase in it. But yesterday was, this, was the same name. It was just uh, basically when yesterday, all my troubles seem so far away. Now the Japanese want me to stay. That's how it started because he was arrested <laughs> in Japan. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think of other other you know, other names. Um, uh, whip it, whip it was whip it, but it was when your puppy wets the floor, you must whip it. Very intellectual comedy, by the way. I'm not, you know, I, I you have to admit that is some sophisticated stuff. I'm Can I tell you there. something though? You know, an audience is a very broad, diverse audience, and all That's they true. want to do is come out and laugh. And you know, humor, humor that everyone. There's nothing wrong with humor that everyone gets. You know, mm -hmm. that's why I love Tom and why why the show really needs him, because I I don't know what what I'm doing, but um, <laughs> none of us know people what and uh, we don't know what you're doing, Doug. So it works out <laughs> now, guys, I mentioned Renaissance Man and I only did rap and Rodney there. But my, the second half of that sentence is we've all seen Easy Money, right? With Rodney Dangerfield. Uh huh. Why do you ask Dennis who wrote that? You wrote the script for that? Let's see. Let's see who wrote that. Well, there were four of us. Okay. It was it was a guy named Rodney Dangerfield had a large hand in it. Um, <laughs> I don't know whatever happened to him. Um, then there was a guy named PJ O'Rourke. You may know PJ. He's a satirist and he he's an essay writer. I think he went to my my university, didn't yeah, he? Go yeah. To uh, Washington University in St. Louis. Probably. I think he came to speak there years okay. ago. Okay. 
Well, he made his bones as a writer, but they somehow corralled him into working on this script. And a guy yeah. named Michael Endler, who was the husband of Rodney's manager at the time. So wow. four of us wrote it. I can't take all the credit. Four of That's us. amazing. Of it. <laughs> amazing. That could you have know? taken all the credit if you hadn't mentioned those three other people, Dennis. I <laughs> could have. But then you know what happens in this world? People would start Googling. And then, you know, I would be a wash on, on Twitter comments. And my profile would rise substantially for being the hack that I am. You know what? Maybe I should have just mentioned myself. Well, you know, instead of being selfish, you could think of how much notoriety our show would get if if we were the ones that, you know, were, you know, where you lied. You know, mm -hmm. we, we were associated with that. Can you, uh, can you edit this show? Is there editing uh, capabilities for this show? I don't, we're not that sophisticated, trust me. Okay, because if there was, I would just, you know, we'd say, let's cut this whole section out. And I will say, yes, when I wrote Easy Money on my back porch in <laughs> Southampton, I remember I turned to William Faulkner and said, get me another mint julep. And, um, but, you know, you don't have editing, so I, uh, I'm, it's already out. We, we probably could figure it out, but, but with my editorial skills, probably what would happen is Tom would just disappear. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Yeah, we can't have that. We can't have so, that. Either. So now we've talked about his comedy. Okay. We've talked about, he's, he wrote a book, he's a writer. We've talked about movies. We've talked about music. Why don't we talk about theater? This guy, we talked, now we talked on this show about classic stand up comics. Joey Bishop was oh. one of those stand up comics that's classic from the 50s and 60s. Dennis played Joey Bishop in, in, with the Rat Pack uh, show in theaters. Wow. Yeah, so I, don't, I don't like to brag, but, um, you know, <laughs> after, you know, I mean, it, it, the writing of Easy Money was so exhausting for me that I needed a break. And I said, um, is there a show, is there a show out there that I could do my much vaunted and never, ever done before in public Joey Bishop impersonation? And luckily, uh, there was a show called The Rat Pack is Back here in Las Vegas. And uh, by golly, they needed a Joey Bishop. Wow. To sort of MC the show and to play Joey in the wonderful scenes that we all know from The Rat Pack and those halcyon days so they put me in uh, a couple of us played uh, mark cohen who's an excellent comedian he played the show he played it before me uh sandy hackett put me in the show who was buddy hackett's son and uh i did it for a little while and then i left and went back on the road and then they put me back in here and there and when carlin died they put me in uh, quite often because i had nothing nothing to do so, <laughs> so that that was that was sandy's show yes you were in because Sandy there's other Hackett rat pack shows. I yeah, Sandy that. Hackett and Dick Feeney were the producers, and then they had a falling out, and Sandy went away, and Dick kept the show going. But yeah, he always, he always, he always had a uh, Joey Bishop until he realized that he could save money by just getting rid of the Joey Bishop because everyone really only cared about uh, Sammy Dean and Frank. So, but but until he made that realization, I was one of the main guys. <laughs> so yeah, I, I'm going to ask you something. I don't know if you can if you remember this, but there's. There's one scene on the Dick Van Dyke show where Dick Van Dyke is either talking to Maury Amsterdam or was anyone Hackett. About I don't know Dick if Van he was Dyke? on. But he, I, I, I might have been Maury Amsterdam. <clears throat> but he told Dick Van Dyke, he said, when I want to talk up, chat up a woman at a bar, he said, I'll turn away from her, pull a nostril hair out of my nose. And then when I turn back to her, I'll have a tear in my eye and I'll say something like, you really look beautiful tonight. <laughs> and with the tear, it, and I've always, I can't, it was so long ago, I can't remember if it was Maury Amsterdam or Buddy Hackett. Mm, I don't remember, I didn't see all of Dick Van Dyke's. I might've missed that one. It might've been. I haven't seen that one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I can I can see Buddy Hackett saying it, except he- Yeah, I, I can see Buddy it. Hackett saying it also. Right. Except there'd be like 85 curse words in the middle. But of I could see either of them. But anyway, um, and that's yeah. a tip for our listening audience. Yeah. Guys, be, be discreet with it. Don't overuse it. By the way, yeah. Doug, I, I haven't even told you yet. I was asked to be in a new show myself called The Fat Pack. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Looking forward to that. <laughs> and you pay you pay a large Joey Bishop. Is that who you play? Yeah. Actually, here, here I don't want to say that show is miscast, but but uh, but he play he plays Sammy. So um, I don't know who cast this show, but be careful. 
Now, Tom and I once did a show where I was him. I played the role of a large person. Oh, wow. Yeah, he did my act, I did his act. And him doing my fat jokes were kind of humorous. You know, you just reminded me of this great cruise ship story that someone told, speaking of, I did his act, you did his. So this comic is on the, sh this comic is a friends with this other comic and uh, he's on the cruise ship and he's bombing terribly and everyone hates him. So he says, in the middle of a show, he goes, what am I gonna do? So he remembers his friend, uh, his, his comic friend doesn't do cruise ships. So he, in a panic, starts doing his friend's act Oh, and, no. and it doesn't go go any better. And he called up his friends and he goes, uh, whatever his name was, Joe, uh, I got to tell you this. I was on a cruise ship and I was bombing and uh, my act just wasn't going over at all. I was just totally bombing. And Joe goes, wow, what happened? He goes, well, uh, I started doing your your act. And Joe goes, oh, what happened? And the comic goes, well, you bombed too. <laughs> <laughs> I love that story. That's funny. <laughs> anyway. There was one time I wanted to do it. Um, I had an opportunity um, without going using any names. There was a sociopathic comic I was associated with, shock sociopaths are in comedy. I know who it is. <laughs> we went to, uh, we, we had a show together. He was headlining and I was one of the others. Mm -hmm. And I forget, I had to get back home kind of early. So I asked the producer if I could go up early. The headliner, sociopath, scumbag, hadn't even arrived yet and i i was like driving this guy around for a year and a half i knew his act mm -hmm. and i realized i could have gone up first done his act left he'd have no idea and he'd get up and do his act you know hey I beautiful audience beautiful beautiful you're beautiful you're beautiful thank you for coming you're beautiful yeah. anyway i i always wanted to do that oh man i would have paid I, to see that <laughs> and I'm not going to get that opportunity because now I'm, I'm clued into sociopaths. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No sociopaths <laughs> in comedy, though, as we all know. Yeah, that's that's a rare a rarity. No, we uh, we put them no in political egomaniac. office. Right. Mm -hmm. Jack tells me you and I are aligned uh, progressively, Dennis, by the way. Oh, OK. So well, that's even that's though we're not talking that's, politics. That's why we're on the uh, left side of the screen or. Right, right. I, 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 I did a, I will tell you this story. You it's kind of right. funny. <laughs> I, I wrote a post. I can't even remember what I wrote a post about. Um, something probably not favorable about our, our former president. And the guy I know who turns out, who's probably an evangelist. Mm -hmm. He, you know, he went on, Trump is great and blah, 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 blah. The final, we're, we're talking and he's, he's got some conspiracy theories he believes the last thing he says is, I can't support a man who believes in abortions after the child is born. Don't you think that's immoral? <laughs> so I wrote back and I said, where did you hear that Biden promotes post-birth abortions? <laughs> he wrote, I heard Biden say it. <laughs> himself <laughs> so i told him to check other news sources but i'm yeah. thinking how how do you live a life so insulated yeah. that yeah. you believe the president of the united states yeah. promoted hey here's yeah. a way and another solution to our covid crisis people it's yeah. gonna sound tough but listen you had a baby yeah. for the country yeah. yes listen god did it with isaac right with the uh, abraham yeah. and isaac that's so true. it's not, That's true. it's been done That's, before. Yes, yes. Uh, anyway, so the, I think it's horrible. I I really, I I could have done better than Biden, but I I, I, admi I think he's going to be fine for us. But now that I, I learn he's okay with that. <laughs> you know what? I thought the guy was okay. But once he started talking about, uh, you know, uh, executing passersby just for no reason, I will never forget the first time I heard that. I believe it was on uh, TikTok. Um, <laughs> that's where I get all my news. Um, but I, yeah, it's it's just horrible to think. Listen, you know, if people are going to go out in public wearing orange and green, they've got to accept the consequences. You really do. You really do. And that's know. a conservative view. And I just want to let, let everyone know on this this uh, this show right now, I am against uh, the the consuming of babies. So, you know, uh, I'm, I'm appalled that this goes on 
and I'm tired of it and I'm sick of it. And if they want to do it, at least do it inside. And this That's is our reformed think. guest, Jonathan Swift. <laughs> right? Wasn't he the guy? Wasn't that his uh, modest proposal? Jonathan Swift does sound like a comics name, doesn't it? Ladies he and gentlemen, was, your he headliner wrote... has been, has no, been on all a... the major talk shows. Jonathan Swift. It's a there is name. a comic that we know named Jonathan Swift. Oh, there is, but he did not write yeah, the from modest proposal. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, good. Well, you remember Jonathan Swift, of course. Right? Oh, yeah. 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 I, don't... I'm, I'm sorry. His his funniest, the funniest line of his, and I still, I think of it to this day, and I don't know why, it was he was getting angry about his kid eating a Pop-Tart, and he said something like, don't eat my Pop-Tart. Alrighty then. <laughs> it's, you know, delivery. It's, it is. <laughs> you think? Yes. <laughs> that was my recounting his great delivery but i i failed i'm sorry you know what rodney used to tell me that if you do, did a three thousand if you did a three thousand seat theater if you got a big laugh what that meant was that at the most a third of the audience was laughing he used to uh -huh. say that so the fact that you know we don't know there's four of us here so if if one of us laughs that's a huge laugh that's it. That's nobody that's laughs that's it's not bad so don't feel intimidated or humiliated in any way Oh, you have no idea who you're talking to, buddy. I'm sorry. You have no idea who you're talking to. I've been in comedy nine years. I can go 10 minutes without getting, I can go 11 minutes without getting a laugh. Am I right, Tom? He can okay. go his whole his whole set without a punchline. Wow. He's, aller he's allergic to punchlines. It's it's amazing to watch. That used you to know be what I do? Alternative comedy. You it? know what I do? Yeah. For, first of all, I learned from comedy class that if you take a comedy class and, and do what they teach you, then everybody from that comedy class sounds exactly the same. Uh, of course, of course. <laughs> so what I do is I put, I put my funny line in the beginning mm -hmm. and then the rest of my set, the audience is just, they're waiting on bated breath. They know it's gonna come. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're like on the, the, the edge of their seat, wondering, mm -hmm. is, be something else. Doug yes. is so unique, he opens with his clothes. Yes, yes. That's what he does. Yes. But I'd never, I've never opened my clothes on stage. I will say that. Well, there's something to be said about that, but I'm not the person to say it. I've, I've <laughs> tried. I've tried. The guys, the guys encourage me. There was one I time never... I started to take off. Oh, I know. It was my bit about uh, I was getting signals from this woman, so I made my move. I took off my shirt. And there'll always be somebody that giggles and I'll say, that's my move. <laughs> and somebody else will giggle and one show i had to say something to a guy in the front you know no i'm stopping there sir don't yeah there you go uh, nothing more you go. Yeah. <laughs> now see you got chuckles from three that's a gigantic laugh in an <laughs> arena so now, speaking of gigantic laughs dennis i met you at the borgata in atlantic city mm -hmm. you you took your your comedic and your musical talent uh, and you joined forces with two other musical comedians, I'll call them, um, who also played guitar and, and sang parody songs, Gary Galena and Paul Bond. Correct. And you formed, you formed an act called the G-Strings. Yes. And I, and I saw you guys every time you came to the Borgata. It was, it, I, to this day, it's probably the best act I've ever seen. It was amazing. Well, it's, yeah, it's funny. Yeah, and it's weird because I remember, you know, I, we... Yeah, have you done the Borgata? No, not, no, not yet. He's no, done the buffet. He's done the buffet. That's, yeah. that's, that's <laughs> what I mean. That, that, that I do comedy in the buffet. So, but, but when they would book comedy, they would book three comics, and you know they'd usually be different, and you know just so the audience would uh, you know not have the same kind of comic three times. Right. Uh, I remember uh, they booked me the, a couple of years ago, and I said, "Oh, great!" And I show up, and uh, I look at who's on the bill, and it's Gary Delina and Paul Bond, and I'm going, "Wait, what?" We got three. You got three guitar comics. That's just strange. And Delina comes. He goes, no, no. And then Richie Minervini, who was booking it at the time. That was Richie and Darcy, right back then. Yes, yes. And I said to Richie, so Richie, to explain this mistake you made, because you've got you've got three guitar comics. He said, no, no, no. This is not a mistake. It's not a mistake. He said, we're, we're, this is all purpose. It's all purpose. He's got to put all three of you together. So you, you, you all come out. You do your different thing. And then, and then, why am I doing Joan Rivers as Richie Minervini? I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> this is really weird. So I always get them confused myself. <laughs> I know, me too. I do. One's more feminine. I can't remember who. 
Um, <laughs> but, uh, but he said, no, you guys, and you guys, and you, you come up with a show and you do, and then you come out of the end for the last 20 minutes and you do a thing together. And I go, oh, well, thanks for telling me. But, uh, but so then the three of us went up to uh, one of our rooms and we said, well, what are we going to do? We said, let's put a show together. And we put a show together. And that's exactly what it was. The three, each of us did 15 minutes uh, alone. Okay. And then we came out at the end like the 20 and it, it worked out great. And I, I really hope we can get that show together again because uh, it was fun to do. And people, yeah, people did enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Tom, you and I should do a show together. Like two mm -hmm. comedians, neither of whom has a guitar. Mm -hmm. And we'll like build it like that. We'll can I play it, the uh, air piano? Yeah, we'll, you can we'll do call, that. Huh? We'll, we'll call it. Uh, are you ready to just listen? We'll just do that too. We'll <laughs> shut up and that. listen. Shut yeah, up and shut listen. Up, shut up and listen. I like that better. That's I true. I remember there were there were times. Um, I remember one particular show in Greenwich Village where I I somebody laughed. I'm in the middle of a sentence. I hadn't said anything funny at all, and I like stopped. And I had to explain life. how, you know, how you're supposed to wait until right. I say something, you know, listen and wait until I say something funny and then you laugh. I, I forget, but it was really, I, I realized on the way home, I probably shouldn't tell the audience not to laugh because any laugh is good, but right. you know. Yeah, you got to take them, especially if you, you don't get a laugh in for, for the first 11 minutes, you got to, you know. Yeah, no, you, you've got, no, but seriously, if they're laughing at the wrong time, there are going to be yeah. some intelligent people thinking, <laughs> these are, these are fucking morons in the audience. Why am I, why am I a part of this? Or like, you can sit there and just realize in, how incredibly brilliant you are, that you, even you don't realize how funny you are just by delivering a straight line. You yeah. know, I've learned when I do that during my set, it, it throws me off. I'm sorry. Well, then you just have. Then you'll just have to stop and do what you did the last time. That's all. What's so unique about Doug is that he doesn't get laughs for 11 minutes, mm -hmm. and he's only doing a seven-minute set. Yeah. <laughs> so a lot of it bleeds over into the encore. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> does he get a Does he get a reverse encore? Is that what he gets? Even when he's at the back of the room at the bar. He's still not getting laughs. So this. My so big, but said, my big so, close is always I'll yeah. say something like, I'm gonna get off soon. And then uh, that and always the, they erupt. Yeah. That, well, usually when I say I'm gonna get off soon, uh, you know, the, <laughs> the women in the audience just say, Well, let's go now. Yeah. Um, and Tom, my good yeah. friend, says, Well, I gotta get off, mm -hmm. but I can't do it here. Yeah, there you go. There Isn't you go. that your line, Tom? Did I get that right? It's a lot of people's lines. <laughs> is it? Yeah, I, I did not make that up. Okay, what, let's what go back to Dennis and Legends. Um, oh, you, okay. you'd, you'd mentioned in passing, you've got a lot of backstory, backstage stories and stuff like that. Any mm -hmm. that come to mind that you think our, oh my Kathy, God. our audience would be about interested Joan in Rivers? hearing? Joan Rivers. Joan Rivers um, was one of these, she was like a den mother. Uh, so she, uh, and, and here's the thing with Joan. When I was with her, her her uh, her show her live show, she was the headliner obviously, but she had two people always had two people opening for her. We could never figure out why she needed two opening acts because we did twenty to twenty five minutes each. So there's fifty minutes of show before Joan even comes on, and uh, sometimes I'd work with uh, Clint Holmes and sometimes I'd work with Jim Stafford, but most of the time I worked with Gary Shandling, and oh, wow. um, and you know got got to meet and hang out with Gary. Who, who actually helped me with my uh, put together my first Tonight Show? So that was very good. But Joan would do things like she'd be a den mother, and like you know, you, you, she would call you up at ten in the morning. And as you know, comics don't get up until you know, one o'clock. Um, <laughs> and ten o'clock in the morning, you'd be sound asleep in your bed, and the phone would ring, and you go, uh, uh, and Joan went, "Yeah, we're all going on the boat." And I'm going, what? What boat? What are you talking? We're in Lake Tahoe. And you're, we're all going. Listen, I told them this. I told Caesars we have to. They have to give us the boat today. We're all going water skiing. I'll meet you downstairs in 10 minutes. Okay. So <laughs> I, 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 I get up from a sound, deep sleep, uh, try to get dressed in time, go downstairs, meet Joan, her hairdresser, her manager, her road manager, and we're all in a, a, a limousine to, 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 go, to, go, to go water skiing. Uh, that happened several times, once with regular skiing. Whenever we were in a place like that, a resort area, we had to go out. The last time I worked with Joan um, was in San Jose, 
And um, we, I hadn't worked with her for a couple of years and take, they called me out of the blue and she's doing a show and says, you want to open for Joan? I said, sure. I brought my wife uh, and who she knew. And um, she goes, Joan's in her gown already. And she's going, you know, I need new shoes. Let's go to Payless. She goes out and stay at best stage. She goes out the backstage door in a full gown. We're walking two blocks to the Payless on the corner. People in their car, cars who are going to the show notice that Joan is walking down the street. Joan, we're coming to see you. Okay, I'll see you there. We go into Payless. She like orders two two pairs of shoes. She gets my wife a cheap pair, um, you know, because what the hell, my wife likes cheap shoes. And then she walks back. She gets her shoes, walks back to the theater. People honking. Gam, gam. Oh, what are you doing? I'm buying shoes. Leave me alone. And then she goes. So that that, that was Joan. That those those are two stories right there. How how, how crazy these people were. Unreal. That's great. <laughs> What, now you're what? based out in uh, in Tahoe, right? Well, now I'm in Las Vegas now. I've been here for oh, eight you're years. You're in Vegas, okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have you have you worked Harry Basil's room? I have worked Harry Basil's room many times. The one in Vegas and the one in uh, Reno too. Um, I, love that. I, and and the Comedy Cellar is here now. Hopefully, it'll remain. I mean, it's been closed since the pandemic, but yeah. uh, that's a hot room. That's I hope that opens because that's a great room too. The town I live in in northern New Jersey, Bergenfield. Is where Harry went to high school and grew oh, up. Oh, okay. What have you? You so know, Harry like, opened for Rodney for the longest of any of us. Yeah. Yeah. But wasn't Paul Bond supposed to do a, a, a TV show with him? With with uh, Rodney? No, Basil. With Harry? I don't. I don't know. I know Paul Bond uh, didn't. He was who was he? Friend? He was friends with like some big star. Was it Jim Brewer? Oh he yeah, a, he opened for Jim. Yeah, right. 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 Yeah. 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 Yeah, I didn't know Paul very well. I know I knew Gary more, but I uh, I just kind of met uh, Paul when we were doing that uh, that show at, at the Borgata yeah. with three guitar comics. <laughs> <laughs> a great story. Yeah. yeah. What's Gary Shandling like? I mean, if he helped you and all. Yeah, Gary was uh, Gary was just crazy. I mean, the thing about how's my hair that he always used to do was totally that wasn't that wasn't a put on. He was constantly worried about how he looked. Uh -huh. I mean, I remember he did his Tonight Show and I called him up and said, Gary, that was a great show. That was a great shot. And dude, the, the jokes were fantastic. And the only thing he said to me was, how did my hair look? Did I look okay? Was that all right? I passed this hotel room once and I'm hearing him talking about his hair to his manager. Here's my favorite story, though. I called up Gary and I, I, um, I left a message on his machine. It was the machine at the time. Right. Uh, I, I had this joke that I was working on and I wanted his feedback. So I told him the joke and I said, so yeah, Gary, uh, let, yeah, call me back. Let me know if I need to change anything in the joke. I hang up, I wait five minutes and I call him back and I leave another message. Yeah, Gary, it's Dennis again. Listen, I left you a message and I haven't heard back from you. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I don't know if it's a question of money or if you need the cash. <laughs> But if you could call me, if you need to call collect, please feel free. I hang up the phone. Three minutes later, the phone rings. It's the operator going, I have a collect call from Gary. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of my faves. How, how can people get your book? They can buy it. Uh, they can go uh, uh, two ways. The, the, the name of the publisher is Bear Manor Media. B-E-A-R-M-A-N-O-R -B -E Media. Dot com, and they can go there and they just you know they type it in uh dennis blair uh tour touring with legends or amazon same deal just type it in it's on amazon too i'm they waiting for it. mine to come i ordered it beautiful dennis I love blair b-l-a-i-r for those Correct. of you who otherwise i don't know how you would be how would they do it b-l-a-r-e i have gotten that i've gotten b-l-a-i-r-e with the there's no e on the end it's just like linda blair Although your name, you know, as a comedian, you have a great name for I, mine too, Doug Max. They can't yes. mess it up. No. I Tom, think I, have I they think messed I, up your name? I think oh, I subscribe they... to your channel. I think I get Doug Max. I get Netflix, Doug Max, and um, Showtime. <laughs> oh, that's I'm sorry. Your life, I'm sorry. Your I, life I'm, is complete. You don't that's need, true. That's, Did you say I, how I, cover, <clears throat> I cover it all. Have you people, people have messed up my name. I, not, not the last name so much, but I always get, I get David all the time. I, I'll get introduced by like, I'll go to a new place, you know, please uh -huh. welcome David Blair. I'm going, yeah, Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they massacre my name all the time. Do they? I'm sorry. You, I've heard you as a man jelly. Oh, man jelly a lot. When I used to teach high school, my, I had one 
little little bastard student that relished in mispronouncing my name man joey mm. and emphasizing mm. the man joey did, did you did you take him out back and thrash him i, I would i like to i would have mm. liked to i've heard that anyway you, you he doesn't tom does would not he would not have thrashed somebody he would have sat on him no yeah well, that's okay i noticed my light is fading wait a minute hold on just a second isn't that better all right there you yes. go Oh, much better. I wasn't, I was going to, I didn't want to say anything. I thought that might be, have been a, you know, a well, sort of prophetic. Uh, it was like, I'm know. slowly dying. Dennis <laughs> is fading into, the, into oblivion, ladies and gentlemen. And we were, we were talking to him. I'd never met him before. And then the lights, <laughs> the lights started getting dimmer and, and, the, and then he was gone. He disappeared. He was, he was having a nice conversation and all of a sudden the young man just faded out of view. And we don't know where he is anymore, but we'll, we'll air this interview and see what people think. Maybe they have theories. Did, did Queen Elizabeth see you when you were with yes. Sir Tom Jones? <laughs> yes, yes, that's, yes, she did, she did. Really? Yeah, <laughs> I don't wow. know, I have no idea. <laughs> Probably not. How, how was it working with Sir Tom? Sir Tom was, uh, you know, I mean, Sir Tom was, you, you said, you, that's correct to call him Sir Tom because he was royalty, so I didn't really hang with him very much. I, I hung with the band, you know, and, uh, you know, and, I, and one of my best memories of working with Tom was this. You ever work at a place called Mud Island in Tennessee? It was no. a huge, it was an outdoor arena, but there would be, it would be like a racetrack. There'd be a huge hollowed out circular section. And in the middle of it, there were these, there was this thing where there were these doors. And I was on stage opening for Tom doing very badly because the audience did not want to hear from me. <laughs> uh, and as I'm uh, as I'm bombing, these doors open in this section about uh, 50 yards away from me. It was the band; they were naked, and oh, the entire band mooned me as I'm on stage. And nobody in the audience could see it because they were behind a barrier. So I have like these 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 12 lily white asses just mooning me. And so so I'm bombing, and I'm and I'm and I'm cracking up at the same time. It was a disaster. <laughs> But I'll never forget those magic moments like that. <laughs> is that in the book? <laughs> that is in the book. Yes. There you go. Now you don't have to get the book. That's the whole no, I want the book. <laughs> other other memories you have from the legends that stand out? Uh, one of my favorites. Can I? Can, 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 I, I apparently we, we can curse on this show, right? Yeah. 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 Sure. Yeah. I already did. Oh, you already did. Okay. So. Uh, I'm in. I'm in. I'm in Chicago uh, doing a show with Rodney Dangerfield. Roger Ebert takes us out to dinner. Now, you know, I've been doing comedy for like a year. And I, you know, before that I was a, I was a guy in a bar doing songs. Uh, now Roger Ebert is taking Rodney and me out to dinner at the pump room in Chicago. Now when, when Rodney would eat, you could not disturb him. His eyes glazed over. Something about him and food, like leave me alone, don't talk to me. So now I'm, I'm, I'm beside uh, Roger Ebert and Rod, Rodney's not talking. So Ebert is talking to me. And Rodney's on my right. He's just chowing down and his eyes are glazed, glazed over. And Roger and I is uh, talking and he's discussing uh, the theory of acting. And Roger's going, well, you know, there are actors that are method actors and the Stanislavski method. And then there's the Buñuel actors and this kind of actor. And there's the ones that, you know, act, act from the outside in and the inside out. And he's being very philosophical. And at, that, at one point, Rodney puts down his turkey leg <laughs> and says, what's all this bullshit about acting? If you don't want to be mad, you act like you're mad. If you want to be sad, you act like you're sad. What's the bullshit? It's all bullshit. Pass the fucking potatoes. <laughs> and Ebert looked at me like, okay. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was a wonderful moment because I tell people that story and they go, you know, Rodney's right. You just, if you add, you, I mean, you're mad, you just act like you're mad, you know. But he's going on and on about methodology. Uh, so I'm sorry, but you reminded me of one of my favorite stories. I'm going to make it quick. Whatever. Passover dinner. Mm -hmm. My 96 year old uncle is joining the family for the Seder. <clears throat> We'd just gone through the hour long service and we're all starving. So mm -hmm. we're doing the past the Hiroset, past this, past the eggs, past the salt water. My uncle, 96 years old, blurts out. My doctor told told me you should clean your rectum. <laughs> Go past the latkes. <laughs> it was something like that. 
He would have been perfect to be at our Roger Ebert dinner. That would have been great. <laughs> I would have, the story, I, I wish I had had the story. If I not, know. I might have written it. In uh, you, you live for moments like that. I'm telling you. <laughs> oh, here's another one. Jews will appreciate. It was uh, another Seder. And, and we're opening up. We, 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 you know, we're all grown up at this point. No real kids. I was like the youngest, you know, at 50. Mm -hmm. So we, it comes to the portion of the service where you have to open up the door for Elijah, who is an invisible prophet, Tom, that mm -hmm. Jews invite to their home. He, okay. um, he also, he, uh, he uh, aligns the space lasers mm -hmm. also. <laughs> anyway, yes. so we're at the service he and we're going to open up the door for Elijah. And my mother says, it's too cold. You'll let the heat out. <laughs> so that stopped that, you know. That was enough to, she'd become reform at that point, I guess. There you go. There you go. My mom, that reminds me of another story, but this has nothing to do with legends. This is something my mom did. She, she, my mom was the king of malaprops. And okay. I remember I, got, I, was like tw I was like 10 years old and I got bit by a dog. Not, not nothing major, but it just like kind of like broke the skin on my, my finger. And mm -hmm. I didn't tell my mother and she found out about it. And she said, I heard you got bit by a dog. I said, well, yeah, it was just a little, it little, wasn't too bad. Did you bleed? Yeah, a little bit. She goes, Dennis, Dennis, you have to tell me if something like that happens. If a dog bites you, don't you know you can get rabbis? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> I'm, on a, I'm on a, a bus in Negril, Jamaica, going to the hotel. I was from the right airport to the, oh, to the thing. And good. the guy next to me, I introduced myself. I go, hi, I'm Doug. He goes, rabbi. I go, you're a rabbi? He goes, no, rabbi. <laughs> That's you know, rob I. Yeah, That's yeah, yeah, I. yeah. It's 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 a Rasta name. Yeah, rabbi, man, rabbi. <laughs> <laughs> well, in Jamaica, Monjeli is Jellyman. Jellyman. There you go. <laughs> Here's another thing that stuck with me with Rodney. We had to take an elevator. We were on the top floor of our hotel, and you know, people get on, and no one recognized them for some reason. But people get on and they push three and they get off at three. And then, then they push five and the elevator stops and you get off at five. And it stops and you get off at seven. And it stops and you get off at nine. Finally, we get to 12 or whatever it was. And Rodney turns to me and goes, that's the problem with being on the top floor. You got to take everybody else's ride. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget that one. Got to take everybody else's ride, man. So yeah. you know the the stories you told of Rodney versus Carla. Mm -hmm. It one of the thoughts that I had as you were telling that story. Tom and I have talked about this as you know comedians that get off the stage and now they're not a comedian anymore. It mm -hmm. sounds like Carlin was a twenty four seven comedian, and it sounds like Rodney had his act and did it as a living and maybe maybe wasn't in the. Yeah, of well, a comedian. I don't know if that's fair or not. But. Well, he was. I mean, he had moments where he was really funny off stage, but not not a lot because, like I said, he was kind of a depressed person. So you know, he just kind of like fumped for around, you know, and just yeah. it was. Yeah, what's every not to be depressed while, about? Every once in a while, for like a for like a minute or two, he'd be like, "Hey, look what happened to me! I'm sixty years, sixty two years old, and I'm a, I'm a famous guy." But that was very rare. Whereas with Carlin, you know, he would just be goofy. Only he'd leave me notes when I'm on stage, you know, these <laughs> horrifying notes. Uh, um, I'm trying to remember, um, there was one note he just left me, he just, just, for, for no, just made no sense. It said, to Dennis Blair, a fine person whose, whose sister had wonderful legs and who blew me on the train, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> he just left that note. And what, he puts this on the stool with the post-it Yeah, yeah I, would, I would come off stage and he'd be on stage and I'd find it on my little counter in my dressing room area. It was great. <laughs> Just stuff like that, you know. Now, did Rodney ever try and sell the aluminum siding? Never. I just, I, I knew him after that. Okay. But you know, these people which would write would send. You know, he paid fifty dollars a joke if you went if you wrote a joke for him, and yeah. he 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 shuffled over to my my room over at Westbury Music Fair once, and he said, "This guy just sent me a hundred jokes." I said, "Oh, that's crazy." He says, no. It's ridiculous. I'm like, that's horrible. All he did was just say something and then he put the phrase no respect at the end of it. And then he would think that's funny. And then he started reading them. He goes, here's, here's one, here's some of them. He goes, I went to the refrigerator. There was no food, no respect. 
I got in my car, I ran out of gas, no respect. And I'm like dying laughing because he's just so bad. I saw this woman, I didn't like the way she looked, no respect. He says, I can write a hundred of these. What do I need him for? <laughs> but, you know, I love seeing like real comedy like that delivered. Cause you know, listen, I'm in nine years. So it, it's not so far back that I go to open mics with people that want to be comedians that aren't funny at all, but they, but they have the persona and yeah. you know, the, the, the charisma and whatever, everything, everything, but the funny. And mm -hmm. it, for me, I find it hysterical when they say something signaling this is the funny part and you're you know you're looking 404 page not found or whatever it is wow wow yeah but they well. but they have that and they look at the audience with yeah. you know with with confidence right right well you know? yeah hopefully and they keep going hopefully they'll come up with actually the funny eventually and then they'll be on their way some of my so one about... of my favorite comedians i was i i listened to him do a, a podcast and he said something like oh i headline in new york all the time and i won't use any names this was not a true thing it was so not true it yeah, made my guy, night tom wow. you you were dying too this, this guy was like the unfunniest guy you ever met oh my and, god and you know me uh -huh. <laughs> yeah and i know doug <laughs> you, yeah, yeah, what were you gonna about, say buy hey, you got the funniest What's that? about buying jokes through, yeah. you know, sending them in the mail. I was in high school about 1970. And um, I, I watched the uh, Steve Allen show. He had an afternoon talk show. Mm -hmm. Rip Taylor was on and said he bought jokes from anyone who sent jokes. And so I sent to the theater where the show was made. Okay. Next thing I know, Rip called me. And I, for two years, I sent him jokes. Mm -hmm. and he was my pen pal. He never paid for one. Not really. And I heard a couple of my jokes on TV, but that's, I had that's a pen great. pal. For, that's for great. a 16-year-old kid, it was, it was great. Yeah. Did you ever meet him? He lived in Vegas until he died last year. Rip Taylor, I did meet him. Uh, well, you know, he, Debbie Reynolds had a hotel in Las right. Vegas. Yep. yep. And um, they, it's the greatest thing. We used to love to go there. Um, because after her show, she would go to the coffee shop and they had a little stage there and they would have a little, like an open mic -y kind of thing where these these like B comics and like jugglers and and there was a Wayne Newton impersonator that would show <laughs> up. And, and they would just go on and do like 10, 15 minutes each and they'd be a singer. And every once in a while, they'd be a really good singer, but more often than not, it was just cheesy. And Rip Taylor and Debbie would host it. And you know, they got Debbie Reynolds and Rip Taylor, they would just kind of like go up there yeah. and kind of host it. And I remember someone introduced me to Rip saying, hey, Rip, this is Dennis Blair. He opens for Rodney. And Rip turned to me and said, oh, you're the one he likes. <laughs> <laughs> and you had his intonation just the way you said that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually met Rip Taylor on, on, a, on a buffet line in Atlantic City at Harrods. Sounds right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sounds right. I actually made him laugh. I don't remember what I said. Uh, I he probably laugh. said... Maybe you should go in front of me. <laughs> Probably. That's exactly it. And then I threw confetti. That's <laughs> on, a buffet, on a buffet line, too. It's so perfect. That's where you'd probably meet Jackie Mason. He was always at the coffee shop yeah. somewhere. He's still at coffee shops in New York. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we just had lunch with him about two years ago. Because every time I go to New York, and Jackie's the first person I ever opened for. Really? And I remember I came off stage. He said, "Well, you're the person who was just on stage." I said, "Yes." He says, "You're very funny for a gentile." And um, <laughs> ever since that, we became friends. And every time I go to New York, he, he, to this day, you know, I always call up Jackie and Jill as manager. We we go to lunch because I know I'll have a line to remember somehow, somewhere. See, that's I, the I met his Jill, his manager. Yeah. yeah. I was gonna I say that's the difference between you and us, uh, Dennis. You're you you've worked with. Uh, Jackie Mason, Doug and I have worked with Sheba Mason, his daughter. Yeah, oh, oh, I, how is she? By the way, how is she as a comedian? Is she good? She's pretty good, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Never I, mentions I, him, though, right? Never mentions him. I don't think there's any I've not worked with her, yeah. and it might be because when I met her the first time, I said, I really liked your father a lot. Oh, that could be it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and she, she, unfortunately, you know what she said, he's alive. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. yeah. That's what you'd say to Joan Crawford's kids too. Hey, I really like your mom. 
<laughs> hey, I just picked up a copy of your mom's parenting book in hardcover. That'll get you in. Hey, with, listen, the dishes got hanging. washed. <laughs> That's you. true. And the hangers got hung. Oh my God. So That's listen, true. we've we've actually we've done our time. Uh-huh. Like, you know, like in prison. Yeah. What are you in for? Do we get so, out of good behavior? So believe it or not. I mean, we can keep on blabbing, but I want to give everyone an opportunity to talk about gigs that they have coming up. And one thing I'm going to mention before we do that, though, the last episode we did this and Tom started going through his list of shows that he's got coming up. Mm. All the comics that had come on to our show asked Tom to perform with him. Uh So he's Uh announcing shows with the comics that he had on our co-hosted show uh-huh. so dennis feel free to mention anything you got coming up but if there's anything coming up with tom i, I do not want to hear about it it's enough <laughs> as far it's as enough. i know I'm, I'm, unless the uh the one or two uh, zoom shows that i have coming up uh include tom uh that's all i got right now it, the only gigs that i do live now on fridays here in las vegas there's a, there's a, a casino called the tuscany hotel and they have a lounge there. And every Friday, I play bass and guitar in this in this uh, band called the Kenny Davidson Band. And there's a different singer every every week. And they come in with a list of songs they want to do. And we do their songs. And we do other people's songs. And we do guest singers. That's the only live gig that I'm doing. No live comedy. I am doing no live comedy except for the Zoom show that I do occasionally. Which is I is live in. comedy going on in Vegas? Uh, I think I think Harry's Club is open. I think the Laugh Factory is open. I think Brad uh, Garrett's Club is open too. Uh, but what twenty five percent, thirty percent? Yeah, I think it's twenty five percent or yeah. something. And I know Harry wanted to use me a couple of months ago, but I said I, I'm not ready to do live. I want to be. I want to wait till this thing blows. I over. told Harry the same thing, and I'm like, yeah. "Come on, I'm going to get on a plane from New Jersey. Give me, yeah. and you got to give me more money." And yeah, he was like, exactly. "Okay, I'll call up Dennis." Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the opportunity. And I went there and it looks like, you know, I guess I, I don't know how it's doing these days, but, you know, but, but whatever. I just didn't feel like doing it. So uh, but then he says he has to uh, someone fall out. Someone had fallen out. But he said, I'll have you on when it's your turn. You know, you got to get through all the comics that got canceled first. So we'll see how things are. But uh, other than that, no. nothing. Okay. Right. Yeah. OK, Tom, we got 10 minutes. Uh, ah. We'll be performing with Dennis Blair. At the famous <laughs> Tuscany Hotel, you'll be you'll bring your uh, your banjo, yeah. your tambourine. Tom yeah. and I are in a vacuum-free uh, society room uh, in in Eubank, Alaska. <laughs> that sounds about right. Yeah. <laughs> now, actually, I'm going to be at the Laurito Winery in New Egypt, New Jersey. Big time. We're talking here. Mm-hmm. Um, Friday, March 26th. It's a 7:30 showtime. Friday and Saturday at Scotty's Comedy Cove. That's April 9th and 10th. That's a 9 p.m. showtime. And who and will you be performing with? I'll be opening for uh, the incomparable Doug Karpf. Doug Karpf, K-A-R-P-F, who will never be on our show again until he gets <laughs> things straight in his head. Go on, Tom. What else you got coming up? But wait, there's more. Uh, and also Tuesday, March 23rd, uh, 8 p.m. showtime at the Laughing Fox in Magnolia, New Jersey, um, who I'll be performing with, Steve Rinaldi, who was also recently on our show. Yeah, and Steve, if he was listening, last time, Tom couldn't remember your name, Steve Rinaldi. I knew your name. I remembered you were on two shows of ours before. I'm sensing a little bitterness. I'm sensing a little sarcasm. Just a little. Just a tiny bit. Dennis, I'm trying to put more emotion into my (laughs) bit so people, so it signals, you know, you, you gotta, you got... How else do I have to connect with people? Because you're an artist. You're trying to be an artist. You have to put more of yourself into your art. I, You know, I, I tried that with my girlfriend. I explained mm. to her. She's mm-hmm. like, why do you always have to? We're in the middle of a serious. Why do you always have to do comedy? <laughs> I finally explained to her recently. I said, honey, you know, I know I'm like almost dead, but I started comedy late, but I'm a comedian. Would you tell Michelangelo not to look at you know the the ripples on that muscle or tell tell Rembrandt to stop doodling on that paper yeah where do you get you get comedy from real life 
I don't want I don't want to appear in your comedy routines. <laughs> I didn't know you were dating Mickey Mouse. That's an interesting uh, hair. It's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, what's her name? Bernadette. From... <laughs> it's like not many people. Yeah, you should write a book. I mean, if you know, I dated Mickey Mouse. Oh, I'm buying copies for my friends. <laughs> I, Dennis, I can't do a book called I Dated Mickey Mouse. You don't know this about my comedy, but but like half of it. Some, I don't know how it happened. It, it kind of found me, but half of my act seems to be bestiality mm. related. <laughs> well, you know, they, say, they, they say you write what you know. So that's what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Dog gives a new meaning to the sentence. I love you. Mm. Mm. E-W-E? Yes, okay. thank you. Thank Listen, you. I studied, I have an advanced degree in psychology and you know, you can do things with operant conditioning that you might not otherwise be aware of. You mm -hmm. know, I, I, good. This is this is an educational show for me. Give a <laughs> give a you a treat. Yeah. You know, you just right sounded time. Italian there. You just sounded yeah. a little bit Italian. Give a you a treat. I'm <laughs> give a you a treat. I'm losing it. I'm totally. That's a losing good. It. That's a that's a punchline. I'm going to use that. I think I'm going to use that as a not only as a punchline as the entire joke. I'm going to. <laughs> and I'm going to give you credit for it, Dennis. Thank you so much. And, and, wow. and, and, and in return, I will give you a White Castle hamburger. See, <laughs> you need to get that last call back in. I want you to put, would you punch a, add, add a flavor hole or two? <clears throat> add a flavor hole or two. <laughs> My favorite Cole so, Porter line. Add a flavor hole or two. Did Groucho sing that? I think he did. <laughs> add a flavor hole or two. And have parties with a you. Nah, okay. Don't let me continue. Do you know Frank Perante? Uh, I know the name. He's the guy who plays Groucho. He does the one night shows. Oh, that's where I know the name. One man shows. Yeah, he's phenomenal. Yeah, Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Good guy. You don't, you you don't think Groucho I'm story phenomenal? That Carla told me? And unbelievable? What? You don't think I'm phenomenal? And you have to go pick out this guy, Frank, who's not even on our show now to call unbelievable. And I'm right here, Tom. I, you in, in, Frank on this in, show. Insecurity is very unusual for a comic. Yeah. You don't see that often. What were you saying, Dennis? Is that a story? Yeah. Uh, this is supposedly a true story about how Groucho, in his when he was uh, in his eighties and very uh, very sickly, and uh -huh. I think Carlin told me the story. He said he heard this. This was a true story. Groucho comes shuffling onto a. Uh, he's in a hotel. He goes shuffling onto a uh, an elevator, and it's one of those old time elevators with the gate that closes uh -huh. and the elevator operator. So the yeah. elevator yeah. operator closes the gate. And he doesn't recognize Groucho. He just closes the gate and he says, what floor? And Groucho takes the cigar out of his mouth and says, I can't get a hot on. What floor is that? <laughs> Short one. <laughs> oh, man. Good. Okay, well, <laughs> I will not. Was that a pregnant pause here? What's going on here? <laughs> and I... I, I want our audience member to know that I'm not going to tell my elevator story involving cucumbers. Thank oh, you. Great. It's oh, almost great. never, it's, it's been appropriate a few times, but I don't mm -hmm. even have to tell the story. I just have to say, I've got a story about cucumbers and people, I don't know what's wrong with comedy audience. They just want to laugh. As soon yeah, as that's you know cucumbers, the tweets start immediately. They, it triggers, they know. <laughs> And and they, know. Oh, they always want me to combine my cucumber story with my ointment story. Somebody always asks, and I say, no, these are these are two separate stories. Why would you think the two would go together? I don't so we know have bestiality, we have bestiality, cucumbers, and ointment. And yeah. I'm getting a, a bad feeling about this whole interview. Tommy, uh, uh, Dennis, you know something? You're giving me a bad feeling about myself too. Well, <laughs> listen, anyway. So I'm going to write. I got to write. That's what I need to do with that. Any way we can help. That's right. On your journey. Yes. So Steve Rinaldi, if you're listening, could it could it could this be why you you asked Tom to perform and not me? Could it have something to do with hey with he my invited act? me too? You can go down anytime you want. Tom, could I could I book myself and just do your act? Sure. Would you be okay you know, with that? People know that I've been on a diet. Maybe you should show up as me. <clears throat> after before and after before and after right i smell a I smell a comedy team <laughs> don't don't say you smell something tom's gonna want to eat it no okay 
<laughs> so, so Jack, believe- you, I'm sorry. I was going to say before we uh, wrap up the show, Jack, was there anything that you wanted to, to pitch? <laughs> pitch working- yeah. uh, speaking of pitchers, I'm wearing my Yankee shirt because pitchers and catchers are reporting this week for spring training. Woo, and wow. thir- 30 days from today is spring. So wow. things to look forward to. Tomorrow, yeah. I'm opening in the living room. And maybe if I'm lucky, I'll move up to the second bedroom. I don't know, but I'll try. Mm-hmm. That's it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, already, I'm already picking out my spring masks from my catalog. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait. Well, listen, freedom, they say, is coming. It looks like, uh, you know, somewhere around July, anybody who wants a vaccine at that point, um, my only concern is that what percentage of our country will be anti-vaxxers and believe that the vaccines are some way to embed a, a chip so they can oh, find you for your post-abortion, oh, for your post-birth. Abortion. I got my second vaccine this morning. Congratulations, yeah. Mazel. And, any effects? Any after effects? No, no, yeah, this show. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly you broke out into a podcast. It was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> on that <coughs> on that note, this has been Funny Talk with Mongelli and Max. Um, I am not Tom Mongelli. And I'm not Doug Max. And mm. the world is grateful for it. And uh, Dennis, you're not Jack Hoffman. And Jack, I'm not. you I'm, are I'm not Dennis Connolly. <laughs> it was so great, Dennis, to have you on the show. Thanks a lot. Thanks for Thank having me here. So Dennis, it. I honestly, I feel like we've, we, we've, we've only touched the surface. We have. Um, and any more, I think you'd probably uh, Doug, file charges I, against us. When, Doug, when you and I go to that show with Dennis and Tom, We'll have a great time. (laughs) (laughs) Can't wait. Be funny. You call that humor? (laughs) You just missed me being funny. (laughs) Oh, that's right. We forgot. We forgot that. That was supposed to come in 17 minutes, Tom. Oh, geez. Okay, so where have people been? Funny Talk with Mangeli and Max has been sponsored by... J. Irwin Productions. If you want a comedy show in or around the New Jersey, New York area, you're, you, you, want a, you want a funny person to come and clean your kitchen or <laughs> living room, Jack will hook you up. He knows out of 250 comics, believe me, believe me, a good 70% of them are desperate enough that for $5, they'll drive two and a half hours, clean up your living room. All you have to do is listen to them, try to be funny for a few minutes. And the truth is, I know some of these comics that have driven two, three hours in snowstorms to some of my shows, right, guys? Yeah, to turn around and say, oh, hey, how far in are you? Can you make it back? (laughs) Yeah, that was some storm, Jack. And we had another one. It's good you didn't, it's good we had coronavirus, because if you had booked, you would have had a show this, uh, the 20 inches we got. We had a couple storms, yeah. No, it was a fundraiser. It was a great organization. They didn't cancel until like a half hour before showtime. And, and, and it was snowing like crazy. And these guys and, and three other comedians were all driving in mm-hmm. from two hours away, three hours away. They were hoping for a tropical vortex to come mm. and cancel out the polar vortex yeah. or something. <laughs> anyway. anyway. Such Thank is the life of Dennis. comedy. Dennis, it's, it was really good meeting you. Loved hearing your stories. Same here. Can't wait to get the book. Yep. I'm, hey. I'm ordering mine tomorrow on Amazon. Hey. hey, you won't be disappointed unless you are. <laughs> and don't be surprised if in a, in a few years we, we write to you and ask if you want to be back on our show again. Well, don't be surprised if I'm off my computer by then. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This has well, been thanks. Funny Talk with Mangeli and Max with our guests, Jack Hoffman and the uh, wonderfully talented Renaissance <laughs> man, comedian, producer, writer, guitar player, bass player. Caterer. Uh, 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 what do you call it when you, Im- Im- when you imitate other people? What do you call that? Impersonator. Impersonator, or, impersonator or annoying guy. One of those two. <laughs> Don't forget Rodeo Clown. Rodeo Clown's good. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, until okay, next time. Tom, well, that cues our song. Why don't okay. you sing us out, Tom, with our 
with our funny talk with Mangeli with Mangeli and Max Song. Theme we song. don't have one. Let's put Dennis on the spot. Could you write us a theme song off the cuff? A theme song? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tom and Doug. Tom and Doug. Make them feel better and give them a hug. Or even better, listen and watch their podcast. Podcast. Boy. How's that? <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Thank you so like much, them. Dennis Blair, like Jack them. Hoffman, Doug Max. I'm Tom Mangeli. We'll see you next time on Funny Talk with Mangeli and Max. Thank Take you again. Care. Take care, you kids. Thank <laughs> you.